to be squared. We just worked out, worked out minus beta v, right? Here's minus beta v squared. That one's also pretty easy to work. Same thought process, integrate either dv dt or integrate um, you know, the v dv dx to get the velocities of function to position. I don't know if I did that here or not. I can't remember. Uh, oh, no, I just found velocity as a function of time and position as a function of time here. I haven't bothered to find velocity as a function of position here. Another well-known differential equation which you can solve and is interesting is Newton's law of cooling. So Newton's law of cooling says what? It says that the rate of change of temperature of an object is proportional to the ambient temperature in which it's immersed. So like the further your object is away from room temperature, the faster it cools. So a question you may have been asked before is a fun question. You get coffee, right? You're going to add a fixed amount of cream, which is in thermal, right? It's, it's, you're taking it out of a refrigerator, so the cream is stuck at a given temperature whenever you put it in. And you're going to put a fixed amount of cream in, right? Um, and the question is, should you add the cream right after you pour the coffee or right before you pour the coffee if you want to keep the coffee as hot as possible when you drink it? So what do you think? You add the cream initially or you add the cream right before you drink it? You're going to leave the coffee sitting somewhere for 10 minutes, let's say. You got something to do. Your child just threw up. You need to clean it up. I'll speak for my own existence. We're all, we had the flu this weekend. It was fun. That was sarcasm. All right. Um, so what do you think? You, yeah, you do it before. Why do you pour in the cream at the start? Because once you pour the cream in, it lowers the temperature of the coffee, right? Which means that Newton's law of cooling says that the rate of change of the temperature is slower. I mean, you have to take that thermal loss sometime from pouring in the cream, but you'll lose less energy to radiative cooling, which is governed by Newton's law of cooling, if you lower the temperature to start with, because then the disparity between the temperature of the coffee with cream versus the temperature of the room is, is smaller. So it's a little bit counterintuitive for some people, this idea, but it's one of the... Um, applications of Newton's law of cooling. I mean, Newton's law of cooling is just this. D, 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 T is minus K times T minus R. R is the room temperature. The thing about Newton's law of cooling is it's got two parameters in it. See, it's got this K, which is like the sort of the thermal conductivity or something. Like this describes how, how coupled the system is to the, the, the ambient system. And then the room temperature. So you got two parameters. So really, Mathematically, Newton's law of cooling is not a single differential equation. It's actually like a family of differential equations. So to solve a Newton's law of cooling problem, you don't just need one initial data piece. You need two. Because first of all, you have to pick out which differential equation you're solving. And then second, you need initial data to solve the differential equation. So Newton's law of coolings have to come with like two pieces of data. This one I give the initial temperature is 150, and the temperature after one minute is 120. And um, also, I have that the room temperature is 70. So, <sighs> why does it? One, two, I need three here? Why do I need three? Oh, I'm an idiot. You need three, because you need one to fix K, one to fix R, and then what? You still need the initial condition to solve the differential equation. Like, once you've fixed K and R, you still need one more thing to fix the solution to the differential equation, not to be a, you know, to be a specific solution as opposed to a family of solutions. But anyway, um, you can solve this differential equation lots of different ways, right? You guys recognize this right now. What is this? This is a what kind? Don't look at this. <laughs> what kind of differential equation is this? Uh, it is a linear, uh, linear ordinary differential equation, right? That's yeah, a linear first order problem. So you could use the integrating factor method. I think that's what I do here, right? This one's pretty forgiving. That's just a constant, right? You could also sep you could like subtract that to the other side, and you could do separation of variables as well. You can solve this one a lot of different ways. Like if you're ignorant of integrating factor method, it shouldn't stop you here. Um, you can still solve it. But it's a pain. Anyway, I get this eventually. <clears throat> Of course, some of you are electrical engineers, right? Oh, here's my, I, I made up a story for the question I asked you beforehand, but we'll skip the story. Another important first order differential equation is that which is given from an RL circuit. 
Some of you are electrical engineers, so this makes you happy. The rest of you are like, ah, let's not talk about it. And I, I understand. I feel your pain. But anyway, Kirchhoff's voltage law is this. And if you look at that, that gives you a differential equation in the current related to the voltage applied. And the coefficient has to do with the resistance and the inductance. We can solve this differential equation using the mathematics we've covered. And we get this as a current as a function of time. The time constant here works out to be L over R. So like L divided by R has units of time. We have to feed the exponential something unitless. And so long story short, the time constant basically tells you how long this thing is active. After five time constants, essentially nothing's happening. Right? The, the, the whatever's happened's happened, right? So if you, um, if, you, if you go to an RL party and you're there past the fifth time constant, it's really just a waste of your time. There's no action. It's here. Oh, I'm sorry, are you guys allowed to go to parties now? I forget. Nobody knows. I mean, I see advertisement for parties in the, in the hallway, so I can only assume that you're allowed to go to parties. Is that right? Oh, so it's not a party, it's a, a celebration. A pre 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 Easter gathering. A pre 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 Easter Okay, I like it. I like it. I like it. Um, Another classic problem that uh, people like a lot are these uh, mixing tank problems. You imagine some sort of big bunch of salt water, and you're dumping water into it. That water might be pure. It might have salt in it at some certain concentration. And then you've got some drain where it's draining out. And then the game to play is how much salt is there in the tank at any given time. So what you do is you model the amount of salt going in versus the amount of salt going out. This gives you a differential equation, and you might or may not be able to solve it. So like this one, I have a tank of salty water, which is also known as brine. Um, you could name your child brine. No one's named their kid brine yet, right? Be like, what's your name? I'm brine. It's a fantastic name, right? They just mean mispronounce brine all the time. Like, no, I'm not brine. I am brine. How dare you? All right. So. Was he salty? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. here. He, was a, he was a salty character. All right. Um, I'm sorry. There's all kinds of horrible jokes. I'll stop. Um, so you had a tank, tank of brine water, or just brine. We don't say brine water. We say brine. 15 kilograms, 15 kilograms of salt dissolved in 1,000 liters at time zero. And then I'm going to uh, dump pure water at 10 liters per minute. And then the salty water drains out at a, at a, also at a rate of 10 liters per minute. So th the volume of water is fixed at 1,000 liters. To make this more fun, you let the water drain out at a faster rate than it drains in, then the volume's variable. That makes the differential equation more nasty. Um, <laughs> but anyway, if it's got fixed input and output, at least the volume's <laughs> constant at 1,000 liters. I say let y of t be the number of kilograms of salt at time t. Um, so how much salt is left in the tank when t equals 20 minutes? Suppose that this tank is arranged such that the concentration of salt is constant throughout, which means there's some big fan in it, and it's like mixing it. So the salt gets mixed. So you're not like having you know, diff different saltiness in different parts. But. So basically, what you do is you just set dy dt equals to the rate in minus the rate out. The rate in is, um, what is it? Zero, right? We're not adding salt to the tank. We're adding pure water. So we're only losing salt. So our in is 0. Our out is 10 liters per minute. That's the flow rate times the concentration. The concentration is the total kilograms, which is y, divided by the total volume, which is 1,000 liters. As you can see, the liters cancel. And this gives you kilograms per minute in terms of units, because y has units of kilograms, just as a check dimensional analysis. Um, anyway, so this gives you dy dt equals to minus y over 100, which you're like, Please, um, I like this for a test question. Please ask me to solve this. Yes, I would like that very much. Um, so we can do that. And you get y of t is 15 e to the minus 0.01 t. And then to find the amount of salt at 20 minutes, you just plug in the appropriate time, 12.28 kilograms. There's like 3,000 different variations on this problem. I'm interested in none of them. Sorry. Um, problem, this, this is example 15. 
we have a population P that grows at a rate which is, di which is directly proportional to the population, um, K1. And furthermore, as the population grows, the death rate ooh, is proportional to the square of the population. Interesting. So um, K2 is the proportionality for the death rate. Um, this is rather, um, you know, it's kind of a somber problem. Um, but uh, so dp dt is k1p minus k2p squared. So here's the population you're adding. Here's the population uh, that's, that's, that's removing itself from the, the count. And um, so that if we believe this model, I don't, um, you get this differential equation, which you separate variables. You do this thing called partial fractions that you guys all know from calculus too. Am I right? Partial fractions? Partial fractions in the house? No? I'm sorry. It's kind of a party theme to this lecture. I'm sorry about that. Um, and you like think, oh, Dr. Cook, he's just a party animal. But I know. It's my reputation. Actually, I, I well, I, know, I should shut up. Um, <laughs> So we integrate, do the partial fractions integrate, and lo and behold, we get that the, oh man, I still haven't solved for P. <sighs> the algebra is a bit of a bear here. A few more lines of algebra, I find the solution. P of T is equal to C times P naught divided by P naught minus P naught minus C, this thing. You could factor out this P naught and rewrite it like this over here if you wanted. So it's kind of like C minus, C over one minus some number times an exponential. As time goes to infinity, what happens? It's easiest to see from this formula. As time goes to infinity, what happens? The exponential term goes and your population goes to C, which is called the carrying capacity. So this kind of birth death rate model has this, this stable carrying capacity, which all populations, whatever you start with, tend to, tend to this. If you're above the carrying capacity, the death rate knocks you back down to it. If you're below the carrying capacity, the birth rate bumps you up to it. But that's what sort of like the, uh, the long term is going to happen. Fun fact, if you look at the 1920 paper by Pearl and Reed, they found that the population as a function of time is 210 divided by 1 plus 51.5 e to the minus 0 0.03 times time, where t is the number of years past 1790. For example, t is equal to 60 in 1850. This was published, like I said, in a 1920 paper. Um, and they were positing that the carrying capacity for the United States population is 210 million. So, yeah, that didn't work. Um, and that's kind of the story with population growth, right? You, you try to model population growth all you want, but the fact of the matter is there are unforeseen events which will drastically alter populations. So population models are great for isolated populations that you have control over, like bacteria in a petri dish, rabbits on an island, um, undergraduates in a university. Um, I don't know, but <laughs> sorry, too soon? It's okay, we haven't, well, yeah, I was gonna say something about a train, but I'll, I'll not do that. Um, I didn't say anything. <laughs> I didn't say anything. Um, here's another fun one. Is it too soon? <laughs> Suppose a raindrop falls, they're in a better place, uh, through the cloud and gathers water from a cloud as it drops towards the ground. And suppose the mass of the raindrop is m, and suppose that as, it, as, the, as the raindrop travels through the cloud, it's, it's picking up water uh, uh, proportional to its mass. You could solve the problem. Um, that would give you dm dt is equal to km. This is a variable mass problem. So instead of looking at F equals MA, I look at minus MG equals to DB DT, but P is equal to M, M, MV, and you get this by the product rule, DM DTV plus M DB DT. So we get this sort of frictional force from the water accreting onto the raindrop. It slows it down, right? As the water adds to it, the raindrop slows from what it would hypothetically otherwise be falling at a faster rate. And uh, you can work this out. And actually, this is an interesting problem because you actually need to I guess it's not that interesting. It's just integrating factor method. And so it's kind of fun to look at. You end up finding a terminal velocity um, minus g over k, which corresponds to the force of friction from the water gaining mass 
to uh, versus gravity. It's like um, minus kV equals to mg or something like that. So this is a very nice interpretation. Um, I tried to solve a more reasonable, realistic version of this, problem 17. I haven't, this, this is not complete. And I don't think it makes sense yet. That's an open problem. Finally, the most interesting example in this notes, and I'll shut up after this, is if you have a flexible rope, four feet and three feet coiled on the edge of a balcony, and then you let it fall off. So you think about how this works. If a rope falls off, right, the amount that's hanging over is the amount that's pulling down. So the force of gravity is variable, because only the, amount, only the rope which is hanging over the edge is pulling the other rope down. So it's a variable mass problem. And um, so again, you have to do kind of like the raindrop analysis. And you end up with this differential equation. I actually had to use the special integrating factor technique, which I didn't even talk about in here to solve it. And it's, it's rather ugly. Last semester, I assigned them a homework problem like this. This semester, I'm not collecting homework. I wonder how many of you will do this problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Next time, we will visualize, not world peace, just differential equations. <laughs>